So in this session, uh, what we're wanting to do is to present uh, an array of research which is ongoing in the several schools of the College of Asia and the Pacific. I should say there's a lot of gender research right across the ANU. We've just recently formed a cross-campus gender institute. I think there's something like 200 staff members working on these issues. Now, um, on this panel today, um, we're wanting to showcase some of our early career researchers like Rebecca Monson and Joyce Wu, who I'll be introducing a bit more formally later. Um, I'm sorry because there were some inaccuracies and not updated things in the program, so I've got to give you apologies from Cathy Lapani. She accepted a late offer to speak at an international conference on sexuality in Madrid. Who could resist this? <laughs> and less happy, an apology from Professor Cathy Robinson, who's actually an expert on Indonesia, who got a very bad flu in Indonesia a week ago and is completely unable to speak this morning. So uh, or, uh, we're in this afternoon. So anyway, our apologies. But what, we, what you will be hearing is case studies from Solomon Islands, Afghanistan, and Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea from myself. But I actually wanted to start with a question to you in the audience. Uh, and this, this is a very sort of leading question, I suppose. What does the word gender mean to you? I mean, just a few quick word associations. Right, okay, some more thoughts? Yeah, so, somebody else here? I mean, I think it's, it's going to be important to think about what gender means in, in the context of our lives. Yeah? <laughs> Uh, for me, gender is, uh, you know, is like uh, the socially constructed uh, pattern of right. how males and females will behave. Right. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a conceptualization and representation of how sex is being, uh, you know, putting into action, like right. the social part of it rather than the biological part of it, that's gender. Yeah. Surely. And it includes both men and women and mm -hmm. other as well. It's not just women. Yeah, important. That. Yeah, and, and another another reflection here. That was definitely what I was saying. That's what you were going to say. <laughs> he took the words right out of your mouth. <laughs> Great. So yes, and somebody else here. Yeah. Hi there, my name's Emily. Um, just to to kind of continue on there. For me, recently it means a lot of the spaces in between what we think of as male and female. Right. That's very much coloured by my experiences with the trans community here. Um, I understand that Asian Pacific region has some very interesting. Around, well. around transgender as well. Thank you very much. And in fact, I, you probably said everything I'm going to say in the first, uh, <laughs> the first few minutes. Okay. So I just wanted to reflect, first of all, on the origins of our word gender. I mean, we can talk about it in lots of different languages around the world, but in English, we can really track a time in the late 1960s where gender stopped being about sort of classes of nouns in, in, in French and became this thing, like the culturally created uh, relationships between men and women, differentiated from the biological characteristics of sexual difference, okay? So I think that it's important to think about this very recent sort of um, uh, reformulation of the word in the English language, and in fact its reformulation in all of, all of uh, the global languages of the world. Um, so I, I would really see it as referring to the historically changing cultures that have created, elaborated and interpreted those differences in diverse ways as plural femininities and as masculinities. So importantly, the study of gender embraces not just women, there's often a mistranslation, but also men and, and also transgendered people. And that's perhaps something we could talk about in discussion. And the concept also brings into play the very complex relationship between gender and diverse sexualities, what we now in contemporary language call hetero, homo and bisexuality. I think it's important also to stress that it's not just concerned with individual identities and relations in the intimate spheres of our daily life and domestic life, but with the wider public worlds of work, of politics, popular culture and the media. And I've got a few slides here just to kind of give you a bit of a sense of changing gender patterns of work in different parts of, of the Pacific. Now, in all such spheres, it also engages questions of power and inequality between persons and groups, distinguished not just by gender, but also by class, by race and religion. 
And I think a lot of contemporary gender scholarship is looking at those kinds of interactions between gender and those uh, other axes of, of, of difference. And I hope that our panelists will, will be picking that up. So uh, as in Australia, the study of gender relations in Asia and the Pacific considers relations of power between people in everyday life, what we might call the local or the microcosmic level. But it also concerns relations at national, regional and international levels. And very often we can see gender crossing over or articulating between these levels. So, for example, in national debates about uh, equal wages at work, in debates about equal political representation, in debates about what is the appropriate form of marriage for a nation. We're having a big one in Australia at the moment about same-sex marriage. Um, there can also be contestations about forms of marriage being legitimated by state systems and religious systems. So, for example, in the history of Indonesia, very big debates about the role of I Islam in structuring not only patterns of marriage and, and inheritance, but also um, when things go wrong, like relations of, of, of divorce, patterns of rape, etc. So, in, and in international and in Nash, and uh, sorry, in regional and international for, fora, we also witness intense and sometimes very fraught debates about gender equality in the context of domestic life, work, political representation, and religious expression. So, I'm referring here to those kinds of debates that go on in UN circuits, but also engage a whole range of civil society actors, uh, NGOs, etc. Now, the problem of gender violence is the sub subject of particular global concern. Now, I'm wanting to follow uh, a very influential author by the name of Sally Ingle Mary, some of whose work we circulated to you. In conceptualising gender violence as any act of violence where the gender of the parties is implicated. So, importantly, this is a much broader concept than just violence against women since it also embraces violence against men and against transgender people. It's also a much broader concept than domestic violence since, since it includes violence beyond the household. It can include violence between people of the same sex and not just between opposite sexes. It can include in certain contexts the violence of parents and other adults against children. It extends then from acts of violence against intimate partners and family members to such acts in the context of ethnic conflicts and wars, the sexual abuse, torture and rape, which often accompanies acts of wounding, military murder and summary execution. And in fact, when I came back from a conference in Perth last night, I watched a, um, a documentary on television which was about the present alleged atrocities that have happened against Tamils in Sri Lanka. So it's very important, I think, to think about gender violence as something that, that covers this whole spectrum from microcosmic to macrocosmic relations. Now, like all violence, gender violence raises profound ethical and political questions about our shared humanity. The study of gender violence in particular raises sharp questions about how we confront cultural and national differences. How do we reconcile the norms of an international system of justice predicated on notions of universal human rights with diverse national practices and even sometimes local norms or laws which legitimate gender violence. In a moment, I'm going to be distilling some of my own thoughts on this subject, especially apropos Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea. But like many of my colleagues, I've been much inspired by the work of Sally Engel Mary. Uh, she's a legal anthropologist based at New York University, but Hilary Charlesworth and I have supported her for an adjunct professorship at the ANU, so if you folks have connected with us in the future, you might see some more public lectures and so forth around. A couple of brilliant books, uh, Human Rights and Gender Violence out of Chicago in 2006, Gender Violence, A Cultural Perspective, A Primer out of Wiley Blackwell in, in 2009. Now, she argues very powerfully that we have to try to transcend this dichotomy between the universal, which is unduly identified with the West, and the particular, which is unduly identified with the non-West. 
and typically with countries in our region, the countries of Asia and the Pacific. We have to credit how developing universal human rights protocols have engaged the work of people from many nations over several decades, and that they draw not just on secular enlightenment models of the human individual, which had their origins in, in Europe around the time of the French Revolution, etc., but a range of other models of shared humanity from diverse philosophies and from different religions. Now, in my early study of debates about gender violence in Vanuatu, um, in a paper um, entitled um, uh, Woman I Got a Right Long Human Right or No, um, and I should say this title is actually um, really the words of this rather wonderful woman, the late Grace Mira Melissa, who was a very powerful politician in this small Pacific archipelago. Woman I Got a Right Long Human Right or No, that is to say, do women have rights? in human rights or not. Now, in the, the paper that, that I wrote, inspired by Grace and the work of women like her in the archipelago, I argued that in translating concept, concepts of human rights and gender equality, we had to consider Christianity as crucial. 95% of the contemporary population of Vanuatu, population presently around 230,000 people, 95% are Christian and committed Christians. Women involved in movements to combat gender violence drew on the language of early Christian missionaries. Conversion in this archipelago started from the mid 19th century. And they also drew on the language of contemporary indigenous movements, particularly the movements of evangelical Christianity. All of these um, ideas promised not just to uplift women, to improve women vis-a-vis -vis men, but also to promote domestic and public peace. So the rhetoric was very much in line with, with the messages of Christianity. So although far more patriarchal messages were read from the Bible by men who opposed them, who quoted things like Adam's rib, for example, far more patriarchal ideas were promoted by some Christian churches and their adherents. These women drew on Christian ideals of a shared humanity and Christian ideals of women's universal connection. And I, I think that this is really important because this, the phase at which they were uh, pursuing these ideas was a period in, uh, I, I would say, global feminist movements where we were really stressing the politics of difference, the difference of women on the basis of race, religion, whatever. But importantly, they were really stressing universalism. But interestingly, what I was suggesting is that the, their universalism was not heard as such because it came from such a small, relatively powerful place. So what I'm wanting to do then is to dislodge this idea that universalism is just something articulated in New York at the UN, etc. <clears throat> so this idea about using Christianity to, as it were, translate human rights into local languages. I mean, the language I just quoted from, woman it got a right along human right or no, that's the pigeon of Vanuatu called Bislama, 110 vernacular languages. These ideas of human rights have now kind of entered the language, not just of the lingua franca, the pigeons, but also of talk place, the, the 110 uh, local languages. So I think we have to see contemporary global conversations about human rights and gender violence involving translations across diverse contexts and not just as importations from some imperial centre in New York to distant peripheries. But in such global uh, conversations, sorry, I've just missed a couple of my slides which are uh, picking up this idea about uh, um, the power of Christianity. Um, but in such global conversations, I suggest our very concept of culture can be a problem. Too often, in the context of development and aid, culture is portrayed as something that's necessarily shared, bounded and eternal. I think this is an incredibly out-of-date, archaic concept of culture, long abandoned by most anthropologists like me and other social theorists, who would rather want to see culture as something contested, open and changing. And what's disturbing is when we see uh, concepts of culture being used in debates around development or human rights in this very sort of reified, old-fashioned sense. <clears throat> 
And I think that this raises the other question about who is it who gets to speak for culture? Especially in debates about gender, we hear those who claim authority to speak. Often um, they tend to be older people, and too often I'd have to say older men. So for example, in the um, idea of custom, which is a Bislamar concept in Vanuatu, there's often this sort of presumption that the main people who can speak for custom are older men. Um, Sally Engel Mary has a very interesting example that she uses in, in the chapter that I referred you to of a notorious gang rape which happened in, in Pakistan in the early 2000s where a number of local authority figures who um, dominated the local tribal council, the panchayat, presumed to define what was customary and what was correct according to Islam. So this was an attempt to, to define what was, what was custom but also what was correct in religious terms. Importantly, their verdict was challenged by a local imam who actually uh, raised, raised the case to, to wider consciousness, as well as eventually by General Musharraf, and of course by a range of Pakistani uh, human rights lawyers and women activists. So I think it's important to see that these latter folk have equal authority to speak for culture and religion, so that we're not just seeing the conservatives somehow as standing for having the right to speak for culture. <coughs> Moreover, I think in our globalising world, we need to be able to speak of transnational cultures which transcend ethnic and national boundaries. As Sally Engel Mary attests through her participant observation research at many meetings between Geneva and New York, Suva and Beijing, we could see that the United Nations itself has a culture which we could, which we could analyse. So with these thoughts in mind, I'm now going to very telegraphically consider some questions about gender violence in contemporary Papua New Guinea. Uh, in January of this year, with a number of my collaborators, uh, we completed editing a book on this subject, and I'm here just offering you some of our uh, conjoint conclusions. This photograph, by the way, is from a public poster that's been used in PNG uh, to combat uh, gender violence. So my first uh, conclusion is there's no doubt, as recent campaigns by Amnesty International, International Women's Development Agency and other NGOs have demonstrated that gender violence is a pervasive problem in both rural and urban areas of New Guinea. The statistics from the earlier Law Reform Commission studies suggested that 67% of rural women and 56% of urban women had been beaten by their husbands while a later study claimed that most adult women in PNG had been assaulted at some stage in their life or raped by either their husbands or other men. So the research in this country suggests then that there is a skewing that most violent assaults are by men on women, especially wives, girlfriends and sometimes daughters. But there are also incidents of attacks by women against men, both in provocation and in retaliation and between women. Secondly, gender violence, and preeminently that of men beating their wives, is seen as normal. In fact, one of our contributors to this book, Fiona Hukula, from the National Research Institute, uses the Bislamar phrase, emi normalia, e normalia. And it's normal in both senses, both as routine and also as justified. Now, in PNG, as in Vanuatu and other parts of the Pacific, Gender violence can be le legitimated both by appeals to custom, local practice, indigenous practice, and Christianity, which, as I've said, is the dominant language in Vanuatu, but this pre prevails across the Pacific. Many men now claim that by paying bride wealth for their wives, they have bought the right to their sexuality, their children, and their work, both at home and in the garden. I should mention that bride price is typically now paid in cash, in the past, it was typically indigenous valuables like pigs and pandanus textiles, etc. So suspicions of infidelity, of women using contraceptives, accusations that women are lazy, not sufficiently nurturing of children or themselves, or simply to a, refusing to obey a husband's wishes can all occasion violent assaults. Alas, several chapters in our book also reveal that Christianity can be used to legitimate violence, 
The husband as head of the household can be likened to Christ as head of the church. Pastors, as much as police, can see their role as one of family reconciliation rather than justice if a wife has been assaulted or raped. And in one of the most disturbing chapters in the book, um, we have reports of a case uh, in, in Medang of the late Father Golly, head of the Legion of Mary in that, in that place, and I think the national head, in fact, actively encouraging abused wives who feared contracting HIV from their unfaithful husbands to suffer and be patient, since he claimed only the wife's forbearance could transform their husbands' minds and hearts. A rather different interpretation of the Bible than what I was hearing from women in Vanuatu. Thirdly, gender violence in PNG is not well adjudicated either by customary informal justice or the state system of police, prisons and courts. The first typically values reconciliation and restoration of communal relations so that rather than compensation going to the victim, the woman who's been raped or assaulted, valuables like pigs or money primarily go to her male kin. The second typically focuses more on the individual victims and perpetrators and privileges punishment and imprisonment once guilt is established. But again, as our different contributors show, there's a dismal record of outcomes for women, particularly those who were victims of rape, and especially if they're young and mobile, and also uh, those rapists who have ended up in prison typically deny any sense of individual responsibility and even rather see themselves as victims of the injustices of modern life as embattled modern men. This is a, an idea about contemporary embattled uh, masculin masculinities that's been developing. Fourth, our research clearly shows that although gender violence has a long history in, in Papua New Guinea, um, where in the past rape was routinely used as a weapon of war in many parts of the highlands and where women were killed in many areas for entering the sacred precincts of men's cult houses. It's actually the dramatic con con transformations of contemporary life which have occasioned new contexts and indeed new catalysts for gender violence. So around the sites of extractive industries like mining and logging, there are particularly intense conflicts between men and women which are entangled with debates about who are landowners and who has access to the new wealth. The violence of rascal gangs in towns like Port Moresby and Garoka and on the connecting highways often entails gender violence as well. So typically thefts from houses or cars are accompanied by sexual abuse and rape and often serial rape, that is gang rape, of a female victim by several men. In talk prison, this is called line-up. And perhaps most worrying has been the way in which the epidemic of HIV has impacted on relations between women and men. In many ancestral cosmologies in the country, women's bodies, and especially their blood at menstruation and birth, was seen as a source of danger and pollution to men. And there were elaborate rites to purge boys of women's blood, and accumulate semen for strength. In some parts of the Highlands, any contact, and especially sexual contact with women, was thought to enfeeble men, and so even, marriage, even in marriage, sex was infrequent. In some places, women more than men were perceived as capable of dangerous witchcraft, which caused sickness and death of people and pigs, <coughs> and ruined people's crops. Now, with the widespread conversion to Christianity, such ideas have been transformed, but have not disappeared. Women, and especially mobile or wayward women, called in talk pisin passenger meri, passenger meri or pamuk meri, these women are seen as the primary sources and the major vectors of HIV. So, in national public media and local fora, Sick, sick AIDS, as it's called, is regularly blamed on female rather than male sexual partners and often sourced to so-called prostitutes. We could debate the wisdom of this word, but women like those two Kina Meri who are making a living selling sex in the vacant blocks of cities or on the edges of highways. <coughs> 
In several valleys of the Highlands, women have been accused of bringing sick AIDS and like witches of old, have been tortured and killed. Now, millions have been spent by AusAid, UNAIDS, the Global Fund and many other NGOs and agencies working in PNG to combat these twin scourges of gender violence and HIV. And I'm going to conclude with some images courtesy of Cathy Lapani, who, as I said, went to Madrid instead. Cathy has shown both through excellent research in the Trobian Islands and at the national level where she's been responsible for writing a lot of the uh, national uh, plans. There's been an unfortunate condensation between local perceptions of danger and disease, evangelical Christian messages about the last days, and indeed some of the earlier public health messages which stress danger and death and especially the threats from so-called high-risk groups like homosexual men and prostitutes. Indeed, some of the earlier confrontational posters and TV messages used to combat both gender violence and HIV and to promote human rights might, it seems, have proved even counterproductive. I would suggest that messages espousing a broader vision of peace and gender equality, espousing mutual respect and even pleasure, not just danger in sex, might prove more productive, and especially so if they can harness Christian precepts, practices and people. And I'm just going to end with a, an image from Vanuatu of One Small Bag Theatre, which is also doing great work on gender violence and HIV. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And, uh, Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to pick up on a few of the themes that Margaret's already mentioned, um, including the significance of Christianity um, and what its relationship with human rights might be, and also the question of how useful or appropriate frameworks that are expressly grounded in human right, in the language of human rights might be. <coughs> Um, and I'm going to do this by looking at how women in Solomon Islands, which is the main country I've been working in, are actually framing their claims to participate in, firstly, the resolution of violent conflict, um, and secondly, how they're framing their claims to greater participation in decision making and dispute resolution in relation to land. And I've got a presentation and some pictures I wanted to show you. Um, so, from um, 1998 to 2003, uh, Solomon Islands suffered a period of social upheaval and civil conflict that's now known by people in the Solomons as the tension. Um, and this conflict's generally understood as having begun in 1998 when groups of mostly young men um, started driving around and evicting settlers from other parts of Solomon Islands off the island of Guadalcanal. And these evictions were mostly directed at people from the neighbouring island of Malaita. The root causes of the conflict were really complex, but they do include the competing claim made by the people of Guadalcanal that their rights as the indigenous custodians of the land were being eroded. Um, particularly by settlers and particularly by settlers from Malaita. And now on the other hand you had the claims of Malaitan settlers who were evicted from the land that they'd occupied for a very long time and in some instances they'd occupied it for generations. Um, so I had a picture up here that is of a chupu, so I'll just describe it for you. A chupu, chupu in the language of um, the particular language of Guadalcanal that I've been working in um, means pile, and it's part of. Um, so the pile can, must consist of pigs, of shell money, um, of food like um, bananas and taro and coconut and things like that, and increasingly also cash. Um, and chupu is used as part of reconciliation ceremonies but also as part of land transactions and to confirm people's rights to land or to confirm transactions over land. And in the picture that I was going to put up for you, you have, um, it's very obvious that there are uh, men in prominent positions in this chupu. So there's one senior man who's handing over shell money and hanging it around the neck of another senior man. 
Um, and this is quite a common sight. I've been to a number of Chupu in Solomon Islands and you usually see men up front and centre doing the talking, doing the handing over of shell money and things like that. Um, and I've also got another picture which also, it's, the story is not as simple as just men doing all the talking, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so a man who has great skills as a narrator and knowledge about custom and tradition is often able to strengthen his position within his group, within his social group, his tribe, um, by becoming a spokesperson for that group. And these men appear in speakers, in ceremonies as speakers, and they also appear in court when there's land disputes. And then they're usually also the signatories on land titles, logging contracts, things like that. Now, women don't become leaders in the same way. There are definitely women leaders on Guadalcanal, but the way they become a leader is quite different. And on Guadalcanal, I've often been told that, okay, the women no sabe talk. The women cannot speak. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean that women can't talk generally in daily life. What it refers to is that women shouldn't really or can't speak in big public gatherings, particularly if they're about certain issues. And the main issue that refers to is land. So you rarely see a woman appear as the spokesperson for her group um, in, a, in a land dispute that uh, arrives in the courts, for example. Now, I want to come back to the tensions. Women's organisations played a really critical role in peacemaking efforts during the conflict. Um, and the best known of these groups is called Women for Peace. By focusing on women peacemakers in my talk today, I don't want to reinforce this idea that all men are warriors and militants and all women are peacemakers. Rather, I'm focusing on women peacemakers because I think that the discursive strategies, so the way they talked, the way Women for Peace framed their claims, I think they can tell us something about how Solomon Islander women have exercised agency and they've carved out a role for themselves in a really highly volatile situation. So what did this group do? Well, Women for Peace were involved in a whole range of activities and they included things like the formation of prayer groups, so women would gather together to pray about the conflict and pray for a resolution to the conflict. They also collected and distributed food, medicine and other essential items to militants as well as to victims of the fighting. They drew attention to the social consequences of the fighting, particularly the way that the conflict was affecting women, youth and children. And they held meetings with politicians, they held meetings with militants, and they basically tried to open up space for mediation and conversation between the different groups. Now, many of these activities could have been easily seen to be a threat to male leadership. In fact, I think that they probably were seen as a threat. And what happened in 2000, where there was um, the signing of a peace agreement, the Townsville Peace Agreement, the militants actually succeeded in having women excluded from those negotiations. And I think that's probably because they were threatened by the role that women were playing. So it's worth asking how did Women for Peace legitimise their involvement in these really highly volatile, violent and highly public arenas? I'm really sorry I don't have the slides to show you because what I was going to do was stick up some quotes from one particular woman, Dr Alice Pollard, who's written a lot about the conflict. Um, and it shows you how they made their claims, but I'm just going, and I don't actually have them in my paper in front of me, so I'm just going to have to tell you what, those, what her arguments do. Um, so Women for Peace consistently emphasised their neutrality, the fact that they weren't taking sides and the fact that they weren't trying to usurp the power exercised by politicians and the male leaders of the militants. And they did this in several ways. Um, Dr Alice Pollard, one of the leaders for Women for Peace, constantly in her work, she's written a lot about um, Women for Peace, but she was also a key woman mobilising the women and sort of speaking out in public. She stresses the neutral, non-partisan and diverse nature of the group. Um, she stresses that they come from many different islands in the Solomons, the fact that they come from many different churches and they have many different political allegiances. She also stressed that the women were united by their common Christianity and by, quote, motherhood. This emphasis on neutrality and unity probably provided a cohesive force for the women and it enabled them to organise across their diverse denominational, religious and ethnic lines. The references to motherhood and Christianity also legitimised the involvement of women in highly public forms of peace building. 
In fact, the cultural construction of women as peacemakers and mothers were pervasive in the language of women for peace, and they draw on the overlapping and interwoven discourses of custom. Margaret's already referred to um, this, um, the Bislama word custom. You find it in PNG and the Solomons as well. Um, custom can, it has a whole lot of meanings, but very loosely it refers to culture, custom, tradition. And women also invoke the idea um, of their cultural authority as mothers, and that this legitimated their involvement in formal public peace building. And this cultural authority they rooted in the overlapping and interwoven discourses of custom and Christianity. So they often drew on um, Bible texts regarding women. They also referred to the idea of women being mothers of the land and of the land being a mother. So from just a few examples that I've given you, you can see that women drew heavily on the idiom of motherhood and they invoked both custom and Christianity to legitimise their peace building work. Now this discourse of motherhood has often been criticised particularly, um, particularly by Western or white feminists. It has the potential to reinforce the idea that women have an innate ca capacity for nurturing, that it's something bio biological, it's inherent in us and that women are more inclined to peace building than combat. The emphasis on motherhood can also be used, has been used to relegate women to the private sphere rather than to the public sphere. However, in the Solomons it's really notable that Women for Peace mobilised references to maternity to motherhood in ways that sought to legitimate their entry into the highly volatile and extremely public arena. So Alice Pollard actually expressly links the nurturing maternal role of women with the language of good governance and of the nation. Now there's two Australian scholars who've noted that the strategies used by women for peace don't seem to have translated into greater po political uh, participation in the post-conflict period. Um, by political representation, they seem to mean the participation of women in the national parliament. <coughs> These scholars place responsibility for this firmly at the feet of the women peacemakers. And they argued that their strategies were, quote, based on gendered stereotypes and that therefore they failed to challenge traditional power imbalances. In particular, they... Sorry, don't worry about it. Yep. In particular... Sorry, sorry. In particular, they write that, quote, it was the conceptualisation of women's activities as those of mothers and not of active citizens that led to their exclusion from the peace process as they failed to challenge the dominant definitions and constructions of power and security, leaving in place the male-dominated political structure. Now, I have quite a few problems with this sort of analysis. Firstly, it blames women for their own subjugation and exclusion. It says that you framed your claims in the wrong way, so you can't expect to have a seat at the table of the National Parliament. It also undervalues the work of women as peacemakers and the risks that they might have been exposed to in doing that work. Attempts to empower women in Solomon Islands by both women and men um, are often associated with sanctions, including violence. And the strategies of women for peace were calculated to achieve particular ends and avoid certain risks. The analysis that I mentioned is also founded on particular assumptions about how we measure the empowerment of women. Why is involvement in parliament used as our measure? Solomon Islander women might be more interested in other forms of empowerment and these might in fact be occurring. And I'll actually come to this in the last bit of my presentation. The analysis also assumes that the conceptualisation of women as mothers is incompatible with the conceptualisation of women as citizens. However, as I mentioned, members of Women for Peace expressly elided the division between public and private and they linked motherhood with citizenship. Finally, for the reasons that I've mentioned, I think that the analysis commits the kind of violence that's often been, um, been critiqued and highlighted by women of colour and post-colonial feminists. It basically frames Solomon Islander women as victims of the cult their cultural and religious traditions, traditions that they draw immense strength and pride from, and it essentially expects them to privilege their identities as women over their cultural and religious identities. I wish I could say that this was unusual in Solomon Islands. Unfortunately, it's not. In the last few years, I've had a lot of opportunities to attend meetings run by NGOs, by donors and civil society organisations, aimed at addressing a huge variety of issues um, related to the status of women. 
In these interactions and in others, I've observed some patterns that I suspect are common elsewhere in the region, and Margaret's already hinted at this in her presentation. So the first is that donors and international women's organisations tend to emphasise discourses and frameworks that are expressly rooted in international human rights law. I don't think this is inherently a problem. It becomes a problem when those frameworks are privileged above any other framework to the extent that they exclude or undermine those alternatives. So for example, many of these organisations, in particular the non-Pacific Islander staff working for them, demonstrate a really deep discomfort with and even sometimes antagonism towards Christian discourses and organisations. As a general rule, this isn't expressed particularly openly, at least not to the Pacific Islanders that might be attending these meetings. However, it's more likely to be ex expressed openly to someone that looks like me. Um, it's, it's understood to be inappropriate, just as openly criticising custom is understood to be inappropriate. However, at least one um, of the global women's organisations that are, is active in the region seems to have a policy of refusing to engage with church groups. And I think this is really unfortunate because, as I've already um, talked about, it's well known that church women's groups can be a real source of empowerment to women, that uh, Christian discourses, that prayer groups can be a source of empowerment to women, and they're also less likely to attract a negative response um, than are other forms of women's mobilisation. More significantly though, I think that it ignores the strategies that are actually being used by women, not only women for peace, but more broadly by women and by men who are challenging the subordinate position of women. Let me now return to the issue of land tenure to wrap up. I've noticed that there are really marked similarities used by, between the strategies that were used by women for peace that I've already mentioned and those used by Solomon Islander men and women who are advocating for a greater role for women in relation to land matters. As I mentioned, the idea of land as mother and the link between maternity and land creates opportunities that are used by both men and women to oppose destructive forms of development as well as the marginalisation from women in decision making. So I talked about how Women for Peace used some of these strategies to, to buttress their role in relation to the conflict. Um, and you also hear these mobilised in relation to the exclusion from, uh, of women from decision making. And, and the more um, problematic forms of development like logging and mining in Solomon Islands. So for example, in 2009, I attended um, a big public meeting in Honiara about land matters. And during that meeting, one well-known woman leader angrily responded to a discussion about logging by turning to many of the men in the meeting and saying, you say that you respect women and that land is your mother. If that's the case, why do you rape your mother? Which is an incredibly powerful and confronting thing to say. She was referring to both the destruction of the ecological value of the land through logging as well as the exclusion of women um, from decision making regarding land use and logging. Women on Guadalcanal uh, regularly invoke the idea of land as a mother and women as mothers of the land. Guadalcanal is a matrilineal society so this means that land is basically, well, your membership of a tribe, which is the land holding group, comes down through your mother. Um, and this idiom emphasises the matrilineal kinship and inheritance structures that provide women with social status and a role in relation to land tenure. In this sense, the emphasis on motherhood has a completely different meaning to what it has when it's used in its Western context. On Guadalcanal and in other matrilineal societies in Solomon Islands, maternal imagery is regularly mobilised by women and by men to challenge the relegation of women to the domestic sphere and to legitimise their involvement in the public sphere. Custom and Christianity are also prominent in debates about women's role in land matters. For a range of reasons that I can't go into here, it's often difficult for women to participate in, land, um, in public dis dispute resolution or decision making. And women that do participate are often those that have really sound knowledge of custom, for example, their genealogies or of Christianity, and are able to frame their arguments to claim greater space. Okay, I now want to return to the argument made by the two scholars I mentioned earlier, that the work undertaken by Women for Peace has resulted in changes, um, has not resulted in changes because they drew on the idea of motherhood. I'd argue that given the importance of land in Solomon Island society, women's involvement in land matters is at least as important as their representation in parliament or their, their um, participation in parliament. 
There's some evidence that the tension, the conflict, opened up new opportunities and new arguments for women's involvement in land matters. On more than one occasion, I've heard the tensions referred to as the consequence of sin, that sin being the exclusion of women from decision making regarding land. So I th and I think this is a really powerful way of framing the tensions and, and claiming greater, a greater space for women's involvement in land matters. So in conclusion, what I want to say is, unfortunately, nothing original, but clearly something that needs to be kept, that must keep being said. Um, paying attention to the strategies that are actually being used by women, as well as by men, is absolutely critical to understanding how they're challenging the subordinate position of women in politics at all levels of society. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for that um, uh, introduction. Um, just to let you know, I'm only giving the, as Margaret mentioned, I'm only giving the Afghanistan case study, but my re a report which is printed, being printed by Oxfam Australia will be coming out later this year, uh, but which is based on my field research in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Timor-Leste. So if you're interested, I um, uh, would suggest you to uh, check Oxfam Australia's website later this year. Um, so what I want to propose to you today is that whilst we can agree that um, violence against women is an issue which occurs in every country, this does not mean that there is a standard blueprint solution which is universally applicable in every context. The assumption that there is a universal solution becomes very problematic when you consider countries such as Afghanistan, uh, where there have been where the broader issue of gender and women's rights have been politicised. Um, if you just think about, you know, a few year, quite a few years ago, um, the US occupation of Afghanistan, on the justification, among many, that we need to liberate Afghan women, and you, if you can remember the images of um, women being stoned by Taliban, and you know that that sort of very political, politicised. Um, so sort of um, message about military campaign was justified on the grounds of liberating women when, you know, uh, as, a, as an excuse. Um, and I guess one of the outcomes of that politicization of women's issues by politicians is that gender and violence against women's issues have become a very sensitive topic in Afghanistan. And to the extent where um, local communities equate women's issues with a Western agenda. Um, despite the history of community-based individual uh, women's activism on women's equality in Afghanistan. And certainly when I was uh, doing my fieldwork uh, in Afghanistan last year, one of the recurring themes which I came to me from the local as well as international NGOs is that gender is a very sensitive topic. Um, one example being that uh, a European non-government organisation which has been operating in the country for the last 20 years particularly in the rural area, on poverty alleviation. Uh, they told me, that related to me one story where um, earlier in 2010, uh, there was this, uh, in one of their project sites, the local woman came to them and said, look, domestic violence is a really big issue and we would really like your organisation to become involved in addressing this situation. And in particular, we want the men in our community to be made aware that this is an issue that we, and that we want it to be stopped. Um, so even though this was a plea coming from the local woman, the organisation, the NGO um, that I spoke to said, well, even though this is you know, coming from local needs, identified by local people, we were in a dilemma because on the one hand, half of the staff said, we, yes, we have to do something. The other half said, well, because gender is such a sensitive issue, if we try to address it, uh, what if something happens? And would that jeopardise our entire aid, camp, uh, aid program? Um, so, you, as you can see from that, and, and some other case um, stories, which I'm, I won't have time to relate to today, um, e uh, including NG, international and national local NGOs themselves, um, they also they themselves also internalise assumptions about and values about gender, which makes gender equality issues, including violence against women, even more difficult to be addressed in the country. Um, and um, so due to this social and political sensitivity about gender in Afghanistan, um, international donors and aid organisations have sought to find different entry points to discuss the issue. 
And one of the things, one of the emerging trend which is coming, emerging from international donors in particular, is this notion that we have to use an Islamic framework as an entry point to get the communities to accept gender projects, particularly on violence against women's issues. Um, which you can see sort of, it, it makes, strategically it makes sense because Afghanistan is, uh, is an Islamic state uh, with a 99% Muslim majority. So for coming from that perspective, if you're talking, um, you know, that using Islam can have a sense of universal or a common, as, as the easiest way to reach a common ground sort of understanding. Um, and certainly from my own perspective, I also recognize that there are much benefits to using Islam as, a, as an entry point in engaging with local communities, because this also includes the opportunity to bring together pro both progressive and conservative clerics and scholars, and to foster dialogue between the two, uh, which is what some of the uh, international and local NGOs have been doing. Uh, however, what I am concerned about is how international development agencies, um, and to some extent, the local non-government organizations as well are pushing for a cookie cutter approach on how to instrumentalize Islam. And that is a very top down and instructive approach, uh, particularly when it comes to involving men in gender equality initiatives. Um, and I'll give you a case study from a joint project, uh, which is between the UNFPA, which is the UN Population Fund, uh, the German bilateral aid agency, uh, known as GIZ, Afghanistan Ministry of Women's Affairs and the Afghan Ministry of Religious Affairs and the Hajj. So this is a joint project between both the Afghanistan government, the German bilateral agency, as well as the UN. Um, the project is called Happy Family, Healthy Society. And basically what its um, premise is, because men are the, are basically, men are the primary decision maker in a household, and that includes actually um, decision making about access to medical and education. So what they've done is they have trained local mullahs, the Islamic clerics in local communities, to be educators, to be um, sort of educators with the men. And basically to advocate local men to provide women with greater access to medical care, to um, girls, to, uh, if they have daughters, to allow girls for uh, education, and that sort of, um, and that, 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 that sort of um, advocacy. And so this project has been in operation since 2007, uh, operating in around 16 districts near Kabul, which is the capital city. Um, I was going to show you some slides from a booklet, um, but uh, fortunately I'm not able to today, so I'll just um, try to quote from memory of, um, of what the booklet mentioned. Um, so even though the project does not directly address violence against women, the religious leaders are trained to talk about uh, gender equality within the context of healthy family relationships. Uh, including domestic violence from an Islamic perspective, and so thus subsuming domestic violence within the wider agenda of family relationship. Um, in addition, um, the project's aim is, is to use the trained religious leaders to reach out to Afghan men with the assumption that men will pay greater attention to religious teachings. Um, as Malawi Amanuddin, a, religious of, uh, a Ministry of Religious Affairs official, who took part in the project explained, when Afghan people are given instruction based on their religious values, they will listen and accept. So it's a very top-down approach, uh, for, at least from the, this gentleman's perspective. Um, and uh, one of the examples was the booklet, uh, which I, I'll just quote from memory. Um, it goes something like this. Um, basically, uh, the booklet says, the entire message of the booklet is, uh, men should regard wife as an equal, he should regard her, quote, as, a, as his best friend. At all times he should treat her with respect, dignity, and consult with her on every matters. Um, and then following with, with that sort of uh, the advocacy messages, then you have uh, these quotes from the Quran and the Hadiths which uh, seek to give religious support to that message. Um, and then there's also very uh, sort of um, nice pictures of, you know, uh, paintings of Afghan men presenting his wife flowers and happy family images throughout the booklet. Um, so I think um, 
the, my, my critique is that this sort of education or sort of pedagogy assumes Afghan men are ignorant. It's assuming they are not politicized or that they are unaware of the, of the attempts and intentions of the donor agencies. Um, taken face value as an education tool on itself, the booklet doesn't even offer opportunities for men to reflect on, on, on what it actually means. For instance, uh, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, most marriages are arranged marriages. It is not, um, there are instances, but it is rare for marriages to be formed based out of friendship and love. So in that context, it is how do you then try to say to a man, you have to see your wife as your best friend. And if you do want him to you know, come to accept that, shouldn't there have been some examples in the booklet on how to relate to a woman or how to begin to understand uh, what it means to be a woman within his society or what it means to be a man in his society? Um, and so in this sense, it feels like the audience of this booklet are not the Afghan men or their community, but rather it's to showcase to the foreign donors and the Western audience on what is being done in Afghanistan. Um, and by using, sorry, one minute, okay. Um, so, okay, so just to quickly summarize, um, it, while international donors have good intentions in, in using Islam, what they're also doing is marginalizing local women and also human rights activists. And it is also presuming that there is only one way on how to use Islam to advocate. And in conclusion, just as there is a risk in, risk in presuming human rights as the normative approach uh, to address gender equality, I think there is also a risk of presuming Islam as the universal approach in Afghanistan. Thank you. <laughs>